You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. As part of our exploration of the book of John many years ago, I dealt with this this text. And now we revisit this text as part of being kingdom strong. And when we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, when we talk about relying on the kingdom resources, we, we, we looked at Ephesians chapter 6 and we talked about the armor of God that was given to us, that has been given to us so that we might be able to take our stand. And uh, as part of us relying on the, our, our kingdom supply, amen. It's one of the things that God has given us in terms of supply. It was the armor of God. And in, in that armor, there was an offensive weapon called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the rhema of God. But I also reminded you that more broadly, the entirety of scripture, the written word of God, the logos word of God, as it is described in other places in, in the Bible, that totality of scripture, we we talked about that in the last week or so as, as, as we just kind of just reminded ourselves of uh, Psalms 19 and Psalms 119. And we looked at Hebrews chapter 4 as well. I, I would be remiss if I didn't identify the most fundamental kingdom resource that we have the foundational kingdom resource that we have. The only reason we can even call ourselves kingdom is because of the living word of God. And I thought it made sense to just spend a, a, a couple of weeks, I'm sure, just exploring this. This, this particular passage and this particular text is so, it's so uh, deep. It, it's, it, I, 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 I'm hesitating right now because I know how important this text is, particularly to the Apostle John. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? It, this, this text is, this text is, 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 is his book, so of course it, it's, it's very it's very important to him. But I, I just want you to grasp this. John begins his gospel with a theological setting as opposed to a historical setting. Matthew begins talking about the genealogy of Jesus, and then he goes into the birth of Jesus. Mark skips the genealogy and the birth and gets straight to the first days of Jesus's public ministry as an adult. Luke starts with the birth story and a little bit of his childhood and then moves into his ministry. But, but that's not how, and that's why, and, and many of the stories and, and, the, and the paracopes and the, and the miracles and the parables the, the, the three, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the synoptic gospels because they really think of it. They sync up in large part. But here is John who says, I got to come at it a different way. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, I, I want to I make a, a different emphasis to you. And here's his emphasis. It really is, it's so powerful in John chapter 20. <clears throat> In verse 31, John reveals his imperative for his gospel. He says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing ye might have life through his name. John says... I want to answer the question for you, and I want you to answer this correctly. I know that the prophet Bill Withers 
asked this question or these two questions. He said, but John said he wasn't the first to ask them. And Bill Withers was asking them in a different situation. He said, but I'm asking them about Jesus. Who is he? Come on, somebody. And what is he to you? That's what Bill wanted to know. Bill wanted to know for a different reason, though. He said, I, I, I saw it when he passed by, when he passed by, your head went to the ground. I don't know who he is, but I think that you do. So I want to know, tell me, who is he? And what is he to you? That's what John is asking. He said, who is he? And what is he to you? He wants us to get this right. These are the stakes. He says, listen, the reason I put this gospel together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the, and the miracles I included and, the, and, and everything that I tell you about this person, I've put it in here for this reason, that these things are written that she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and here are the stakes, and that by believing, ye might have what? Life through his name. And because I need you to know who he is, I'm starting my gospel in a different way. I have to take it all the way back to eternity past so you can get a full appreciation of who he is. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. That, that statement is, is, is so powerful. That statement is, is, is so, I want to say, off the chain that that it has to be unpacked amen and that's what we're here to do we're here to unpack we're here to unpack that this this understanding of him saying in the beginning was the the word the logos in the beginning was the word but but before we even do that in order to to help frame the stakes for us and in order for me to to give to do justice to the urgency I believe the Apostle John has around his opening. The urgency of this exploration of who is he and what is he to you. I've got to tell you just a few things about why. Why do we need to know? Why is it important for us to know who he is? Why? Why do we need to pursue this? I would tell you, beloved, this will be or is the most important pursuit in your life. Amen. This is the most important pursuit to answer that question. Who is he? And what is he to you? It's the most important pursuit that you'll ever have. There's an urgency that's there. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 says this. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It's the most important pursuit because the pursuit of prestige, the pursuit of position, the pursuit of provision, and the pursuit of power, as we've just seen in a demonstration this week, and we've seen throughout the presidency of over the last four years that those pursuits of prestige or power, position or provision will lead to pride. But the pursuit of God will reveal purpose. That's why this is the most important pursuit. You better get on board to understanding who he is. You won't you and I won't even become. Hmm. You won't even become a kingdom person if you cannot answer who he is. 
And you definitely won't be what you need to be when you become a kingdom person, which is you got to be a follower of Jesus Christ, not just a professor of Jesus Christ. You can't just profess him. You've got to follow him. You can't just enter the land by belief. You've got to take the land through obedience. You better know who you're dealing with as a resource for everything you need, for everything you need. You better answer this question. It is the most important pursuit of your life. And there's an urgency that John has around saying, I've got to let people know who this guy is. And not only will it be the most, this isn't even my message. Not only will it, it, it be the most important pursuit, I will tell you, it's the most impactful pursuit to find out who Jesus is. Really find out who he is. Understand who he is. Because it's impactful because if you know who God is, it shows you who you are. Isaiah chapter 6, and you're familiar with this passage of Scripture. He saw the, the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they called to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, is what Isaiah said. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Isaiah did his job for five chapters because as a man of God and a prophet, he was speaking woe to other people. Woe, woe, woe. Woe to you that go house to house. Woe to you who do this and that. But when he saw the, the Lord high and lifted up, the only thing he could say is, woe is me. I am undone. If you don't know who Jesus is, you can't possibly know who you are. You can't get a realistic view of yourself. You will constantly believe that you're more worthy, better uh, than you actually are. You'll actually think you're good. You'll actually think that you got it together. You'll actually think it's about you. If you, if, if you see God high and lifted up, if you understand who Jesus was in eternity past, what his purpose was here on, on, on earth and what he's trying to do to restore you to a relationship with God, then you will begin to understand that you really are not all that. But if you do think you're all of that, it will be in the absence of understanding who he is and what he is to you. So it is the most impactful pursuit. It's the most imperative pursuit. Jesus says in John 17 in his high priestly prayer, he says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your, your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those that you have given to him. Now, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. <laughs> Listen, Jesus, in his own words, as he prays to the Father, literally tells us what eternal life is is there is no other way again neither is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved he, he said there's only one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus this is so important this is so Im, 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 imperative that jesus says literally this is eternal life that they may know you but whoo they better get to know me whom you have sent that's eternal life and without Jesus and knowing him, you will not have eternal life. These things were written so that ye might believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And by believing, ye might have life in his name. These are the stakes, beloved. It's the most imperative pursuit. It's the most important. It's the most impactful. And it should be to just two more things. I just want to tell you, it should be the most impassioned pursuit. Seek the Lord and his strength. 
seek his face evermore. That's what Psalms 105 and 4 says. One of our favorite songs, my favorite song that we sing often at this church in Psalms 42, as the deer panteth after the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Where shall I go and appeal before God? He says, as the deer, it's got to be an impassioned pursuit. You need to be, you need to be pursuing this knowledge of who God is to the fullest. Amen. And then in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul says some words in, in, in chapter 10 that just let you know how impassioned that he, that he is appearing to be about this pursuit of the kingdom. When he starts out in Philippians chapter 3 and he's talking about all of the things that he did in Christ. No, he did, excuse me, as a Pharisee, as a non-believer before Christ. And he says, literally, I count all of those things, what? As dung. They're worthless. And I will trade all of that to continue to pursue Jesus Christ. He says, I, I, was, I was all, but whatever was to my prophet, verse 7 says, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What did more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is faith in, in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. He said, I want to know him. I've got to know him. I've got to know the person. I've got to know the persecution. I've got to know the, 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 the perishings. I've got to know the power. I've got to know all four of those things. He says, I, and I've got to know him and the power of his, the person, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, persecution, being made conformable unto his death, the perishing. I got to know the person, but not only the person, I want to know the power. Not only the power, I want to know the, 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 the persecution, not just the persecution. I want to know the perishing. I want to know how I can die to self so that I can live for him. I've got to know him. And everything I've done in my life up to this point is worthless. I got to trade it all. It's the most impassioned pursuit I'll ever have. Can you imagine your assignment is to paint a house You talk to the owner of the house. He says, I'm going on vacation, but I need you to paint the house. Here's my address. It's the third house on the left. Say, got it. You get there. You get on the street. You start working. And you do an awesome job. You do it right. You scrape off the old paint. You take your time. There was things he wanted around different colors, around the shutters versus the main. You do a perfect job. The owner comes back. And he looks and he says, you did a great job on that house. But well, that's not my house. You painted the third house on the right, not the third house on the left. Do you know what? No matter how hard you worked or what a great job it was, you can't transfer any of that work from one house to the other. That house is still undone. You did not achieve your objective. You worked and you slaved and you focused, but you did it on the wrong house. There are going to be so many folks that, that have worked and slaved because they have pursued things that I just mentioned to you, like power and prestige and provision that lead to pride, but have not pursued Christ, which leads to purpose. They have no purpose and they will be nothing that they can transfer from one house to another. That's why the apostle Paul says, I count it all loss. I count it all dung. It's all rubble. It's nothing I can do. I can only pursue from this day forward those things that will lead me to a place where I will know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death. It's an impassioned pursuit. 
last but not least, it will be, beloved, the most improbable pursuit. The Apostle Paul spends Romans 9, 10, and 11 talking about God and choice and, and things having to do with Israel and how God has preferred Jacob over Esau. He said the, even before anything happened, even when they were in the womb, he said, Jacob, I love Esau. I hate it. And he explains how he's working all of these things out. And literally, right when you read that, I can imagine when you get near the end of Romans 11 and he lays it all out, your head and my head <clears throat> literally feel like it's getting ready to pop off of our bodies. It does not make sense. And then the Apostle Paul breaks out in a doxology. Doxa meaning glory. And this is simply what he says to wrap up this exploration of some of the, the tallest theological grass you can walk through in Scripture. And he simply says this, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of God, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. He said, now, now, now let that marinate. I know I blew your head off with all this other stuff, but you better understand how unrich, how the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his ways, his judgments and his ways past finding out. It will be an improbable pursuit, this mystery of God. And we do not know completely or exhaustively or what we know we don't know even comprehensively. But we cannot stop on our pursuit to know him and his power and his perishing and his persecution. We've got to keep going. That's, those are the stakes, I believe, that the Apostle John is trying to relay when he says in the beginning was the word now to a greek person that's reading that in a greek audience i just want you to understand what they would interpret the word to be it wasn't like this was a brand new concept, but the Apostle John was investing and infusing new meaning into it. Amen. He was investing and infusing new meaning into it. To the Greeks, when they heard that word logos and you talking about the word, the word was the divine essence that held all things together. The Stoics in 300 BC spent time talking about this. They, they, they knew that there was something that held everything together, amen? It, a power that kept things in order. It, it was even a mind or a reason that kept things in their proper place. So again, it was like, we know that there's something that's holding things together. And we call, they literally, they called it the word. It was the logos that, that, that did that. It was this, again, this divine essence that held all things together. It kind of reminds me of, if you're a Star Wars type person, just as a contemporary kind of cultural reference, to them the word was like the what? The force. Obi-Wan told Luke, 
The force is what gives a Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It brings the galaxy together. That's what he was describing the force. And so not unlike that same concept, they're saying this word, this word is a divine essence. It's It is a divine essence that keeps all things together and in order. And it's even the mind that that we have a mind that even allows us to 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 keep things in their in their proper place. It it, the word also enable men to think and reason in the world around them and also to be able to come in contact with God. And now he is letting the Greek readers know that that word is not a force it's not an essence it is located in a person and his name is jesus christ that's that's mind-blowing that's like literally if you're watching star wars you find out all of this time that the force is not everywhere in all things it's like somebody dropping a actually let me let you know the force is a person and his name is whatever his name is in that instance. <laughs> Don't get too far down the road on that. But you understand what I'm saying? If you were all of this time, you're like, oh, my gosh, how could that be? We thought the fort. Yeah, all of that was how you were trying to process what, you, what your, your infinite, your finite, excuse me, mind what, what was trying to, to deal with. I'm letting you know that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then he goes on to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the father filled with grace and truth. They were like, what? Yeah. The word is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. You think about what the apostle Paul, remember, in in, in Acts chapter 17 when he was in Athens? And they said to him, a group of Epicurean and Stoic. And just remember, I told you the Stoics were the ones that, that, that kind of, I don't say maybe originated, but at least maintained this, this idea of the word, this divine essence. They, they said they were these group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with Paul. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then he took him and brought him to a meeting of the Arapaeus, and they, they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And then Paul stood up in the meeting and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And then he goes on to talk about how men, uh, uh, that that God uh, has men, and, and he says, in him we live and move and have our being. But they were confused because he was locating this divine essence in the person of Jesus Christ. What is this babbler trying to say? It's the same thing that John, if you want to call him a babbler, is trying to say in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's what I'm trying to say. He's letting the Greek readers know that the word is a person and his name is Jesus. Jesus is is the discloser of the divine essence. Amen. He is the. (laughs) He is the discloser of the divine essence. Now, imagine you're a Jewish reader. To the Jews, the word of God was more than just an utterance or a sound. 
the, the word of God possessed power to express something. It was purposeful and creative. That's why when you look back at Genesis and it says, and God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be a firmament uh, uh, in the midst of the, the waters. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. That was terribly consistent with what the, the Jews would understand about the word of God, that the word of God had, had a, was purposeful and was creative. The power that made the world and gave light and life to men. Let there be light. Let us make man in our own image. All of those things, they, they attributed it to the word of God. Amen. The word of God was revelatory in that it expressed what God desired. Even if you were a prophet like Hosea was or any of the other prophets, you would see something like the word of the Lord came to unto Hosea and he said thus and so the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea and the Lord said to Hosea, go and do thus and so. So again, it's thus saith the Lord. It's the prophets even they maintain I'm not speaking for myself. I'm telling you the word of God. It expressed what God desired. The word of God was a message to his people and even his standard for holiness. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The standard of holiness, the creative expression and what he desired. Now John is telling them all of that is located in a person. It's located in a person so that when you get, when you get to 1 John chapter 1, John introduces that book. It's his book again. Listen to what he says. This is what he's trying to convey, and I see... I see an urgency on John's face and in his writing that says, listen, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That life appeared and we have seen it and testified to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the which was with the father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father. And with his son. Jesus Christ. What the eyes have seen which we've looked at, which we've touched. We've touched the word. God's ultimate expression, God's ultimate message, God's ultimate revelation, God's ultimate connection that God desires to express to us is in the person of Jesus Christ. If you were reading this early on and you were Jew or Greek, he would be literally blowing your mind. But he says, I need you to grasp that the word is not just the divine, the, the disclosure of a divine, it's not just a divine essence. It's not just the divine intelligence. Jesus is the eternal expression of the divine intelligence. And Jesus Jesus is the disclosure of the divine essence, divine intelligence, divine essence. Yes, it's all in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came. Through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It says in verse 18, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So when you get to Hebrews chapter 1, 
And, and, and I'm telling you all of these different verses because I want you to see how connected this narrative is and how important it is for you and for me to grasp who he is. That's why when the writer of Hebrews gets to Hebrews chapter 1, and I can't, I can't, I just, I can't read it in the, I can't read it in the NIV. I got to read it in the King James because that's the way I know it. <laughs> yes. yes. God, uh-huh. who at sundry times mm. and in divers matters, yes, manners, excuse me, sundry times in, in different ways, mm-hmm. different, different times and in divers manners, in different ways and at different times, mm-hmm. different times, different ways, excuse me. He spoke to us in the past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding of his power of all things by the word the logos of his power when he had himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand on majesty on high he said listen in the past god revealed himself through creation for sure romans 1 tells us that he revealed himself in the cloud which he did with the children of israel the cloud a pillar of fire by Night in the pillar of cloud by day. But in these last times, he says, he has revealed himself not through creation, not through the cloud, but through a Christ, an anointed one, an appointed one, the Messiah. That's why Peter said in Acts chapter 2, he said, this same Jesus that you crucified hath the God made both Lord and Christ. Let me break down the story for you. This same Jesus that you crucified, God made him Lord and Christ. And they said, what should shall we do then with this information? He said, repent. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, repent. And he said they were added to that day, 3,000 souls. It always comes down to not only who is he, but what is he? What are you going to do with this Jesus, this living word? You, you got to make a decision around him. And, and this decision is so important because it, it's life. It's eternal life, yes, but Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You're literally, if you don't have Jesus, you're literally not even living right now, let alone eternal life. You don't even know what life is. You're like what they describe in those, in those uh, movies when somebody is on death row. And they're getting ready to go to the electric chair. When they leave their cell and they're walking along, somebody will invariably say in these movies, look, dead man walking. Dead man. I know he's moving. I know you see him. I know he walked past you. I know he ate a meal. I know you you, you see an expression on his face, but he is as dead as dead can be. He's a dead man walking. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, the living word, if you don't know who he is and you have not made a decision to go ahead and commit your life to him that you might have eternal life, you won't even have life in this world. Because as we'll learn, in the next, be reminded of in the next week, he literally says, because he's light and he's life. The word. The word. In the beginning. And we'll break that down next time. But in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You got to know. You got to know who you're dealing with. And the reason that our world is as jacked up as it is is because when they look at a true north for them, Jesus is not the true north. It's not their most imperative pursuit. It's not their most important pursuit. It's not their most impassioned pursuit. For some, the pursuit's so improbable that they just 
haven't pursued it. But for you and for me, we have to be reminded that Jesus is the living word. And there is no kingdom without him. There's no life without him. There's no meaning without him. Literally, there is no purpose without him. A pursuit of anything but Jesus ends in selfish pride. But a pursuit of Jesus ends in life-giving purpose. I could just see the Jews and the Greeks like, what? Divine essence, divine intelligence. Yeah, God speaking, but... Yeah, God was speaking. He did in diverse times and in sundry manners. He did speak by the prophets, but now he has chosen in these last days to speak to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things and by whom he created the world. He is the express image of his purpose, purpose a, a person and the brightness of his glory. I'm talking about Jesus. You got to get on board with Jesus. Jesus said it himself, and this is eternal life that they may know you the one true God and your son whom you sent you're not going to get anywhere in the next life let alone in this life if you don't know who he is who is he and what is he to you